Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, good day, everyone. It's great to see you again. I'm excited about what I have to share with you today. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray for your blessing over us and that your presence will be here. Pray that you would open our eyes to your truth, that we may behold wondrous things from your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. She has no money or likelihood of obtaining the $500 needed for its purchase, but my daughter Rachel sees a beautiful green bicycle with a basket advertised and decides that it's hers. <laughs> she continues to believe that God will provide as she prays for her bike, even though seemingly there's absolutely no way ahead. But Psalm 37 verses 4 and 5 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. It's not unusual then when Rachel's husband, Joel, informs her that money that has been promised to them has unexpectedly been forwarded to him more than enough and he purchases the bike the basket and everything that she needs to ride her new green bike very cool in genesis 26 and verse 1 isaac and rebecca are facing a similar time of not enough a severe famine now struck the land as had happened before in abraham's time why does the Lord allow famine in a land where he said he would bless Abraham? It doesn't seem to be right. Isaac is very wealthy. Not much good having wealth if he goes bankrupt because of a famine. Isaac moves to Gerah. And this is still in the promised land. Why did he go to Gerah on the coast where the Philistines live? More water, trade, but, but extremely dangerous, so much less safe. Later, the Philistines are enemies. Isaac has a large retinue of people trailing after him, and he is responsible to protect and feed them. Why go there in the middle of danger? During this famine time, the Lord appears. We're not told exactly how he showed up, but obviously Isaac was intending to go to Egypt like Abraham had done during a similar time of famine. And the Lord specifically tells him not to go. He doesn't want him there. Why? Was it because people in Egypt served other gods? Was it because it would mean Isaac would have to leave the promised land? Later, a descendant of Isaac called Joseph would go to Egypt, but certainly not by choice. What interests me is that we are not necessarily protected from the famine times. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is that God can bless us even in the times of extreme need, when finances aren't there, when the river runs dry, when there seems no way ahead. In fact, God seems to speak the loudest in the midst of the famine and testing times of life. Unfortunately, when all I see is famine, potential loss and difficult circumstances, then my spiritual hearing 
is affected and I can still easily miss the powerful voice of God's authority. I can become deaf to him. God gives Isaac the opportunity to obey him during a tough time and to stay within the sphere of his promises. The land he promises is the land that sustains them. What God promises in his word will always sustain my life, no matter what I'm going through. I don't need to look elsewhere just because it gets tough. I'm reminded that Psalms 23 and verse 5 says that the Lord prepares a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. He promises to provide for me even when all I can see around me is potential trouble and things get a little tough. Then I won't simply get off my bike and give up because it isn't working for me. I will trust in God to help me work things through. In Genesis 26 and verse 3, God tells Isaac to live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father. So this famine is a test of trust for Isaac, as it was with Abraham. Same test different member of the family. The question is, will I trust the Lord to provide? Will I face such a test? Will you face such a test? Even Jesus faced a desert experience with no food and extreme temptation to take the easy way out. As a follower of Christ, I am a citizen of heaven, but I walk as a foreigner in this world. God's intention is that he will be with me and bless me. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 says, He will never leave us or forsake us. And the invitation is to trust him during the difficult times that we are facing. Do my desires for my life reflect his? When the going gets tough, am I staying within the boundaries of his promises and trusting him to provide and to bless? You have no money? Well, what, what colour is that bike again? <laughs> when even my wants are in line with the desires of the one who has authority in my life, then God will provide for me and his presence will ride with me. Only I'm sure that he would want me to ride a mountain bike, Lord. Back to the future for those who weren't around in 1985. Come to think of it, I think all of you are around in 1985. Is an American science fiction adventure film starring Michael J. Fox. It could easily be a remake of Genesis 26. Marty McFly is sent back in time from 1985 to 1955 in a DeLorean and its plutonium-powered flux capacitator. Back in 1955, he meets his future parents in high school. And then the unthinkable happens. He accidentally attracts his future mother, Lorraine, romantically. Gross. Marty has to repair the damage to history by getting his parents to fall in love. Otherwise, he won't have a future. He has a photo of his family in his pocket and his image is gradually fading. Marty's future father is George. George, as a teenager, is afraid of a bully called Biff. And Biff starts to pick on George and Lorraine. 
And for once in his life, George stands up to Biff and with one punch knocks him out. Lorraine, Marty's future mother, is smitten with George immediately and they kiss on a 1950s dance floor. Eventually, they will marry. And this assures Marty of his existence in the future. Now all Marty has to do is to get back home to the future. With the help of scientist Dr. Emmett Brown, Doc, who harnesses a lightning bolt to power the DeLorean's flux capacitator, Marty finds his way back to the future. I want a plutonium powered flux capacitator for my Subaru. Is it called a capacitator or a capacitor? I want to be able to go back into the past and correct all the mistakes I have made. If I can't have that, then spare me from repeating those same mistakes so that my past doesn't keep becoming my future. Isaac has a similar problem in Genesis 26. Isaac's father, Abraham, Abram back then, back in Genesis 20, was afraid of a man called Abimelech. Biff? Abraham has a beautiful wife called Sarai. He doesn't want Abimelech to get jealous and attract attention, so he tells Abimelech that Sarah is his sister. But the unthinkable happens. Sarah attracts the unwanted attention of Abimelech. Abimelech takes Sarah into his harem with the intention of sleeping with her. Somebody has to repair the damage. Otherwise, Isaac won't have a future. He won't be part of Abraham's family. And the photo is gradually fading. Well, fortunately, God intervenes. Who needs a plutonium-powered flux capacitor to protect the future when you have the power of God on your side? A curse is placed on Abimelech until he returns Sarah to Abraham. Thus, Isaac's future is assured. Now, the interesting thing is that many years later, Abraham's son makes exactly the same mistake as his father. Isaac travels to a place called Gira and meets a man called Abimelech, also deja vu. Like his father, Isaac is afraid that Abimelech will be jealous of his beautiful wife and try to kill him. So he tells people that Rebecca is his sister and not his wife. He's just repeating history. The question is, will he destroy his future by his lie? He has put his whole future at risk because he is not willing to trust in God. Well, fortunately, Abimelech sees Isaac caressing Rebekah and confronts Isaac with the lie. Abimelech is more concerned about the truth, it seems, than Isaac is and orders his men not to touch them. What is the future that God has planned for Isaac? In Genesis 26 and verses 3 and 4, God says, Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, God keeps his promises made to Isaac. In the future, Christ would intervene into history as a descendant of Isaac and would bless the nations of the earth as promised and repair all the damage that was done in the past. No need for a DeLorean to go back in time and fix my mistakes and sins. All we need is to trust in Christ and what he has done for us when he died for our sins. Not a bad deal, but it requires faith. Faith in Christ alone as our Saviour.
What is the future that God has planned for you? The invitation is to stop repeating your past or living in regret. Only Christ can deal once and for all with my past mistakes so that they do not become a part of my future. Divinely generated faith, like a lightning bolt and a plutonium powered flux capacitor, helps me find my way back to the future that God intended for me before the photo fades. Well, God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for this passage of scripture that speaks about our past and speaks about our future. We thank you, Father, for your blessing upon us. And we pray that you would help us to fulfill all that you have desired for our lives. We pray that our will might be totally in line with your will for us. For us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great day.